The reason I did Scarface, or how it came to my attention, is I was watching the, the old Paul Muni film uh, about 3 o'clock one morning when I couldn't sleep, or one evening when I couldn't sleep, and it occurred to me that a film like that, a film like Scarface, the rise and fall of an American gangster, uh, had not been done, certainly not been done recently. Had been done since Scarface. Don't stop me. I am. I'm giving you orders for the last time. There's only one thing that gets orders and gives orders. And this is it. I'm going to write my name all over the town with it in big letters. Hey, stop him, somebody. Get out of my way, Jenny. I'm going to spit. <laughs> Having had done a number of films with Pacino, I'd always wanted to do a large gangster film where he would have a part to play in this genre. And it occurred to me that this was uh, not the old Scarface, because the old Scarface had to do with prohibition, but the rise and fall of a gangster, an American gangster, a dynasty. I talked to Al about it, and I said, you know, there's something here. I don't know where it is yet. I had heard about Scarface for a long time because I, I was working on a play by Bertolt Brecht called Arturo Ui, which was very influenced by the uh, American gangster picture. And I heard, even as a kid, I remember my, uh, my relatives talking about uh, the Scarface and how George Raft flips the half a dollar. And, and so I had heard a lot about it and never saw the picture. So I was one day walking uh, along uh, Sunset Boulevard, of all places, and there was the, uh, I believe it's the Tiffany Theater now, and it was playing in a double bill with something else, I forget, it was Scarface, and there was a few of us. So I said, well, why don't we just go and take a look at it? And uh, we went in, and it was, uh, you know, an astounding movie, astounding. And the performance of uh, Paul Muniz was, uh, was astounding and inspiring. And I thought after that, uh, that I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to imitate him. I wanted to do something. I was inspired by that performance. And I called Marty Bregman, who then um, put together some people, and uh, they started working on developing this as a, as a film. We started to work on Scarface with David Rabe. Uh, that was the first screenwriter on it. And David and I were working on it, and the screenplay was not exactly uh, going like everybody wanted it to. It was, and, uh, and ultimately, I felt that we couldn't all agree on what we were trying to do. And uh, David and I left the project. And I started to talk to other people. And one of the, one of the people I talked to was Sidney Lumet. Sidney Lumet had the idea of putting it in Cuba which I thought was a, was a brilliant idea. For years, I remember even Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro had the Scarface uh, movie in their, in their repertoire of things they wanted to do. And it was a difficult thing to break through and find the, um, a way in to do it in today's world. He says, well, why don't you do this about the cocaine world? And it occurred to me that that's, that's it. That's it. And I enlisted Oliver, Oliver who I'd known for a long, long time. Very good friends, and uh, we embarked on this venture, this quest to explore the cocaine world. He came to me after my the failure of my picture I directed called The Hand, and uh, wanted my services uh, back as a writer. And I needed money, and I was in a tough place. Uh, I was leaving America, and he said he wanted to do Scarface. I said I'm not really interested in remakes, you know. It was not until uh, Sidney Lamette came into the picture, I think shortly thereafter, we had another conversation. And he told me that Sidney Lamette was very anxious to do the movie and uh, wanted to do it Cuban, uh, Miami, 1980, 81, the Marielle boat lift to Miami. I started into the uh, research into Miami. Uh, I went to uh, Miami extensively and uh, I got to know both sides. I got to know the, uh, the law enforcement side, the attorney general's, the attorney's office, the uh, gangster elements through the lawyers, the ex-gangster elements, and, the, and then eventually I wanted more, and I plunged on into the uh, Caribbean. I went down to Bimini. 
On another trip, a separate trip, I went to Ecuador and to uh, Bolivia. I, I had my wife was with me because she was sort of like part of my security. A man with a woman that seems a little s less uh, sinister or less intrusive than, than a single man. Naturally, we struck up conversations with a lot of guys with jewelry, kind of playboy types. And I told them I was a screenwriter and I was doing a movie about this stuff, and they were flattered. We started talking and uh, went back to their place, drinking, snorting, having a party. And I had mentioned the name of somebody who had helped me in Miami with my research. This person had been a uh, defense attorney. When I mentioned the name, their faces went white. It meant that I may have been in some way connected to the prosecution or to a cop or an enforcement officer, and I was just pretending to be a screenwriter, and I was going underground here. I knew I was in trouble. It was a scary moment, and it was good for me to get back in touch with that fear that I had felt so often in Vietnam, because that fear is sort of what the essence of Scarface is about. If you can capture those moments of fear, uh, the concept of you don't know what's going to happen next, and the violence can come at any time. And I wrote Scarface in Paris, actually. It got me away from uh, that world of cocaine, because I was doing cocaine myself, and uh, it was uh, interfering with my thought process, and my brain cells were being damaged, you know? So I really needed to get away from America, because I knew too many people here who were doing coke. It was a time of cocaine and excess. You do too much of that shit, you know? Nothing exceeds like excess. You should know that. I just got the script, and uh, on the first reading of the script, I, I realized how Oliver had captured that world and uh, made it his own and, and, and brought out that uh, the wonderful uh, texture and nuance and, uh, and power. When Sidney read the screenplay, he didn't quite like it. He felt it should take more of a political direction, and I thought that didn't, not only wouldn't work, it wasn't true. He thought it was too violent and uh, over the top and didn't, wasn't what he wanted to do. So he left the project, which was disappointing. And uh, obviously I would have loved to have directed. I had directed The Hand and Seizure, but it was a big film with Pacino and they would not let me direct it. I went out and looked for another director and ultimately found De Palma, who saw the film uh, as I saw it, as Oliver had written it. When I first started with David Ray, we had more or less tried to start with the original Scarface Italian Chicago. The script that came to me ultimately that Bregman had developed with Stone was completely different. Nothing I had ever envisioned and that's why I liked it so much because it was a whole new way of approaching this material and those elements were in the original script. I liked the material specifically because to me, it was sort of like a modern metaphor for the treasure of Sierra Madre, where cocaine becomes gold, and, uh, and it's a kind of the American dream gone crazy, where you have this product that you can turn into millions of dollars, but in the process, you destroy your life. Um, and it's sort of like the capitalist dream gone bizarre and berserk and as crazy as it can get and completely self-destructive. I think the direction that, that we chose was pretty much embodied in the original Scarface. The elements that were basic in the construction of the Muni Scarface. I like Johnny, but I like you more. I like Frank, you know? Only I like you better. It was the sister, the mother, the Manola, the Manny character, okay? His love affair with the, his competitor's girlfriend. I mean, all of these things were in the original Scarface. And Oliver, being the brilliant writer that he is, invented the rest of it. Bregman made some very, very important and very helpful suggestions. Pacino had some good ideas. Brian De Palma came onto the project and uh, was very supportive. And uh, when we came to shoot the film, he allowed me to um, take part in the film, be there, and, and study it. You know, Al is very much interested in the material and how the character is developed and how it's plotted out. And, and Oliver, of course, has very strong opinions. And it was a kind of lively collaboration, as I recall. All I have in this world is my balls and my word. And I don't break them for no one. Do you understand? Do you want to go on with me to say it? If you don't, then you make a move.
Okay. You want to give me the cash? Or do I kill your brother first? Before I kill you. Why don't you try sticking your head up your ass? See if it fits. I would say the most defining experience about Scarface was my first opportunity to work with a truly great actor. Working with Al, he's like an you know, incredible talent. All of the films that I have made with Al, I have created for him, specifically for him, specifically for the things that I thought he could do best playing. I have a long and an old relationship with, with Pacino. I represented him when he first started. So I have a, a great knowledge of his instrument, which helped me in Scarface and the other films I made with him. I'm Tony Montana, a political prisoner from Cuba. And I want my fucking human right now. I felt that this Scarface was a piece of so many different kinds of gangsters we've seen. He was representative of, um, of a collective uh, person. He wasn't um, organized so much. He seemed almost like a, a renegade in all of this. Uh, even though he would comply, you knew eventually that he couldn't stick to any uh, format, any controlled environment. He was out of control, which was an attractive thing in his character to play. Who put this thing together? Me. That's who. Who do I trust? Me. But it was a long, arduous casting process. Stephen was somebody that we saw right in the beginning and liked right in the beginning. I was born in Cuba in uh, 56. Um, actually, I was born the day that, that Fidel Castro arrived from Mexico, you know, ready to start the revolution. My dad, uh, at a certain point, decided that things were not going to get any better. So he gathered us together, and he took us to the airport. My little brother, myself, and my mom, it's 1960. They got off the ground, and once they were in, airspace, in the uh, international airspace, uh, he said, uh, I'm not going back. I'm out, I'm gone. So he arrived in Miami, he had a dime in his pocket. We lived from house to house, from different people's houses in the first few months, and uh, did the whole uh, exile experience. We're gonna be out of this place in 30 days. Not only that, but we got a green card and a job in Miami, man. That what we made, or what we made, man. Over the years, I grew up to be an American. I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like the kids in my school who didn't have Spanish surnames got through high school, went to Europe, saw Europe, and uh, came home and I said, I've got to do something. I went to junior college just to kind of kill time and then uh, and I walked into an audition for, for a play, for a Tennessee Williams play, and I got cast. And once I was in the process, in the rehearsal process, I said, this is it, this is what I do. I was living in Manhattan and studying with Stella Adler and going through that whole uh, journey uh, of uh, the starving actor. And I got a call about an interview and this woman, uh, she's casting this film. It's called Scarface. It's starring Al Pacino. And the second role is his buddy. So I go, and she says, oh my god, they're right. You're, you're perfect. She goes, I have to call Brian. And she gets on the phone and calls Brian. And, uh, and Brian says, send him over. So I go meet Brian. He says, OK, um, all right, so you speak Spanish, right? Yeah, you're cute. You're really cute. Yeah, I'm Cuban. And he goes, OK, well, he calls Marty Bregman. He says, OK, I'm calling the producer calls Bregman, he goes, yeah, he's right, he's perfect. So I went back to L.A. and I met Marty Bregman. And Bregman, from day one, says to me in his voice, you know, he says, kid, you're going to do this movie. You're going to play Manny. You can't get the part yet because there's a lot of variables, a lot of things. But hang on to this thought. Learn this, be it, and be ready. When the time comes, step in. You're going to do it. Stephen Bauer was chosen to play the second male lead in this. Uh, after he had read for us. His background certainly didn't indicate that he could stand up on screen next to Al because most of his scenes were with Pacino. And if you look at any of Pacino's work, it's very difficult to watch any other actor if he's on the screen. And Stephen, in a reading, convinced us very quickly that he was the right, he was the right person for this. Eventually, uh, we said, okay, you're gonna meet Al. He was in Brian's uh, office and uh, I went over there, and uh, it was love at first sight, though. It was great. Uh, I walked in, and he was there, you know? He was there, and he's, you know, he's just a, he's like a kid, you know? And we just, we hit it off, like, immediately, immediately. 
it was done deal. It was like we were ready to start to be those guys. Stephen and I became very close friends, and uh, we spent uh, much, much time together, and just going over uh, our relationship and what it was in the past, and we enjoyed it. We had fun doing that, making a kind of a scenario, making up a story, and that was um, a lot of the work we did together. Tell him what you told me to tell him. I told him, told him you were... I was in sanitation. They didn't go for it. Sanitation? Yeah. I told you to tell him you was in a sanitarium, <laughs> not sanitation. But there was a long process until we ultimately settled on the final cast. You know, we're getting to a point where these decisions had to be made. Al would sort of go back and forth about, well, this is good, but this isn't quite working. And uh, we ultimately had a screen test at the ninth hour uh, and finally decided on Michelle. Tony Montana. Hello. Annie Rivera. Vida. Michelle Pfeiffer was a young actress that nobody had heard of. Michelle Pfeiffer's agent called me and suggested that I meet with her. And I said, well, if she would be good enough to fly herself in, I would see that she would certainly get a reading. And she did. For me, that was very important. I had every intention of paying for her transportation, which we did before we hired a couple months later. But if a young actor is that committed or is that interested in doing that role, that they would take the dollars, and they would, which are hard-earned dollars at that point in their careers, and come in or make that kind of an effort. We always pick up the tab. And she did, and we auditioned her with, we, we read her with Al, with a lot of other young ladies. I think we auditioned every young actress in the business at that point. And at the theater that we used as a, as a casting, when she got up on stage, she brought Al to life. Hey, Jose. Who, I when, and how I fuck is none of your business, okay? Now you're talking to me, baby. That I like, okay? Keep it coming, baby. Don't call me baby. I'm not your baby. Yeah, not yet, but you gotta give me some time. It's interesting because I don't think even he was aware of it, but it happened. The relationship happened there. It was right then and there. Because nobody heard of this girl, and nobody we were interested in maybe casting this role up, but when she was just magic. And that's why, that's why we use it. There was no question in my mind from the moment I saw her read that she was going to do this part. Michelle Pfeiffer was very interesting uh, because it was one of her earlier movies. And I think she was uh, very attentive and committed. And, and she is a very um, uh, involved working person. She's, she's, she's involved all the way. And I think with this picture, I didn't know her. And uh, she seemed uh, like she wanted to uh, discuss a lot of what was going on. And I remember her being very intense and, and interesting. I cut you here again. I'm gonna wipe you all over this fucking place. Oh, you yeah. understand, Jack? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Do it now. I wanna see it. I wanna see it now, big Don't shot. push me, baby. No, I wanna Don't see you it now. Get, get, get the fuck out of here. Mary Elizabeth Lance Antonia was a very wonderful young actress when I first met her. And the, we, we picked her like we picked uh, Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer. We read her, and she was magic. And she was the person. She was Gina. Mary Elizabeth, I remember the re rehearsing with her and, and, and going over some. I can even remember talking about what was going on in this relationship because it was a, a strange thing that does take place. And I don't think he thought of his sister that way. But he felt a love for her and he felt a purity for her that, that obviously represented something to him. Uh, he, he endowed her with this kind of innocence and saintliness. It was an odd thing and an interesting thing to have in a movie. It had a certain tragic element to it. She's beautiful. How come you... Hey! Just stay away from her. You hear? She not for you. We just clicked, you know, she was their favorite and, uh, and I was their favorite and they put us together and we read and, and, and it was just right. The chemistry was right and uh, she's just as wholesome and as able to turn and be that fire, you know, that spitfire, you know, when she turns on him. You got some nerve! You got some nerve, Tony! You think you can come in here now and tell me what to do? Get out of here. You can't tell me what to do, Tony. No more. I am not a baby anymore. I'll do what I want to do. I'll see whoever I want to see. And if I want to fuck him, Tony, then I'll fuck him. Come on. Come on.
I don't know why all her scenes used to make me like, I, I get all choked up because she was it was so she's so pure, you know. It comes down to one thing, only boy, huh? and you never forget. Lesson number one. Don't underestimate the other guy's greed. <laughs> Robert Lozier was chosen again on the basis of a reading. Robert Loggia is a fine actor, and he fit the role, and he did an exemplary job. I thought Robert Loggia seemed to, to, to just embody this guy, and, and uh, he was, I felt very, uh, very daring in his, in, his, in his portrayal. He and F. Murray Abraham, I thought both of them uh, contributed a great deal to the movie. How do you think of him? I think he's a fucking peasant. <laughs> yeah. But you give a guy like that on your side, breaks his back for you. The group that we surrounded Pacino with in the film were all Cuban, basically all Cuban. Anytime that there was a problem in the accent, in Al's accent, they had the right to interfere and suggest that this, that he was off with it. You a communist? Huh? How'd you like it? They tell you all the time what to do, what to think. What to feel. Robert Easton was a tremendous help to me with the dialect and also the um, Cuban people who I met and spoke with who gave me a lot of uh, insights into some of the uh, mannerisms and stuff. All of which I tried to put into a capsule and swallow and see what would come out. And I was trying more not to be as authentic because I don't believe you can really be authentic unless you can mimic very well. But if I could take the accent and the mannerisms and, and sort of just heighten them in a way for this, uh, for this approach to this movie, because I think Brian De Palma was going to take a, a larger-than-life approach to this film to uh, conceptually deal with the movie in a more operatic style, just slightly larger than life. And so I think that was uh, incorporated into my interpretation. Al did a lot of the interesting things. When I first met him, we were doing some screen tests. We were testing Michelle Pfeiffer and other ladies. And then um, after we finished that day, he said, Johnny, can I ask you a big favor? I said, yeah. He said, only speak Spanish to me once we start the movie. I said, really? Why? He said, I, I want to hear Spanish. And he said, maybe I don't understand, but just talk to me in Spanish. So I did. For the entire picture, Al Pacino and John Alonzo spoke Spanish. He was a Spanish himself, so when I was off with an accent, I asked John if he would help me. and. I love that he spoke to me in Spanish. That's part of his preparation, and I think that's part of uh, what makes him one of America's finest actors. We had a month of rehearsal time. This is unheard of, you know, but Bregman insisted on it, and Brian insisted on it, and we rehearsed that thing. So we could have taken it on the road like a play. Scene, 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 bang, bang, bang. We had a great cast, you know, these great actors. And Brian was great, his graciousness and his generosity and, his, and the wisdom, really, that it took to allow what he allowed, allow for exploration and spontaneity when there was room for it. It was a whole ensemble piece and uh, a lot of playing the scenes back and forth and uh, Al and the other actors would find, you know, they would improvise things and find things to uh, build into the scenes and Oliver would come back and rewrite them. There was a lot of that. I felt good when he was involved because first of all, he responded to the script in such a passionate and positive way. And this idea he had of making this thing larger than life, a little bit more uh, heightened, the reality, appealed to me. Say hello to my little friend! And I know every actor I've ever met does Tony Montana. This country, you've got to make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. You know, whether it's Bruce Willis, who does an incredible Tony Montana, or Tom Cruise, who does an incredible Tony Montana, or Alec Baldwin. I mean, you know, they all do him. I mean, it's like, you know, we used to do Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront. You know, it's such a audacious character with such wonderful lines. You know, and Al did such an incredible performance that, you know, every actor in the world loves to play that part. So say good night to the bad guy. Come on. 
The last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. 